If you will make your way to Galatians uh, with me, easy starting place, we're in Galatians 1. Uh, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 5 today, and uh, just getting an introduction basically to this book. I hope that you've had time to read this, um, this book in its entirety. Just sit down and read it. It will take you 15, 20 minutes uh, at the most to do that, and uh, if you've not done that, some of you have, and you've told me that, and it's a blessing to me. If you've not done that, please do take time uh, to do that this week. Um, starting a, a new thing for me, I'm leaving narrative preaching. So First and Second Samuel is narrative preaching. We're, we're following the storyline of, of people's lives. And uh, then we're moving now to what's a teaching book. It's a didactic uh, book. Paul's writing a letter teaching stuff. And man, is it uh, core stuff uh, to the Christian life. So a um, little different way of, of preaching. And so pray for me as I kind of switch gears on that. But I want us to uh, stand, if you will, and read with me. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 10 this morning. We will not get that far in the preaching but we'll read uh, that much. This is God's Word. It's the only perfect thing you're going to hear out of me today. And it says this, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised Him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me. If you, you notice, there's a parenthetical thought. Paul says, Paul, an apostle, and all the brethren who are with me. That's his introduction. That's his opening to the letter. And he puts in all of that other stuff in there. And we'll talk about why. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, to our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have you ever heard Paul say that? Yeah. yeah, he just said that in 2 Timothy 4. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. In other words, it's not another option. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Strong word, anathema, cursed, damned. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a slave of Christ. Wow. Amen to that. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this word. Um, I thank you that it is your word. Lips of Paul, pen of Paul, but the words of the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote as the Holy Spirit of God moved him to write. And we thank you for it. We treasure that. And we pray that you teach us this morning through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. <clears throat> this book of Galatians, um, we're, again, this morning, very much uh, an introduction to this book. And the biggest question we could ask as we begin is, what is Galatians about? Well, it's, it's about correcting a false gospel. And it's about correcting a very prevalent false gospel. There are billions of people in this world who believe the false gospel that Paul is correcting in this letter. There are maybe millions of people who are professing Christians who believe this gospel that Paul corrects. And there may be that there are some in this room who are believing a false gospel and Paul is writing to correct it today. 
And so I want to encourage you to hear uh, very well. The most vital question that we can ask is this gospel question. How, as a sinner, can I be made right with the God against whom I have sinned? Let me say that again. The gospel question is this. How can I, a sinner, be made right with the God against whom I have sinned? And the most prevalent answer to that question in this world is by keeping these laws, by fulfilling these rituals, by maintaining these standards. That's the false gospel. And by it, anyone and everyone in this room would be lost. Paul writes to clearly state the true gospel. He is going to layer an argument. As you read this book, you're, there are going to be times when you go, what, what, did he, what is he getting at here? What does he say right there? I don't understand that. Paul is layering an argument to convince these people again that salvation comes only one way. That the answer to that gospel question, how can I as a sinner be made right with the God against whom I have sinned, that the only answer to that is this, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, to the, and Paul says it again, to the glory of God alone. That is the gospel. It is the declaration of liberty that far outweighs any document by any government in the world. And I am excited about studying it together. This, this truth is the cry of the Reformation. The, the five solas, we ran down four of them. This is the cry of men like Wycliffe and Luther and Beza and Calvin and Knox, men who decided that they needed to actually read the Word of God instead of simply following the traditions of men. And in reading the Word of God, it didn't matter how far they were geographically separated, they all came to the same understanding. Because listen to me, God's Word through the Spirit of God is very clear. And what we see in the Reformation are these little fires that spring up, isolated from each other all over the world because men simply read the Bible. This year we celebrate the 507th anniversary of that Reformation. 507 years in October will be that anniversary. This morning uh, we find out that it started way before 507 years ago. It's, it started at the beginning. It started with the gospel of Jesus. Now, when you think about the background, and y'all, I have done something crazy to my microphone, so it's doing, it's doing really weird things. Um, I, will, I will adjust and keep preaching. Ignore the, the, the thing on my face. When, when you look at uh, studying a book or getting a, a background of a book, you think about things like, and you'll see this. If you have a study Bible, you'll, you'll look at the beginning of every book and you'll have a little section. If it's a study Bible, and it'll tell you who's the author, uh, what's the date it was written, what's the background, what's the main lessons of this. That's such a helpful thing. Uh, take time to look at that in your Bibles. Uh, it will help you to understand why the author is writing what the author is writing. And we're going to do a little bit of that this morning. Who's the author of the book of Galatians? You know it. Shout it out. It's, it's the Apostle Paul. And I love it. Even, even the most liberal, woo, crazy scholars in the world who de deny everything in the Bible, they say, yeah, this one's, this one's written by Paul. <laughs> And it's not only a claim that the language, the theology, the testimony of the early church fathers is universal. Paul wrote this one. I love an easy answer. When did he write it? Well, this a date of this is certainly before AD 50, uh, more likely around 48 AD. And you say, well, I don't care. I don't know ADs. I don't know BCs. I just, okay, that's fine. It's important because 48 uh, AD is about... 15 to 18 years after the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Um, which is really soon. Uh, we talked about the Apocrypha a little bit last week. Two to three hundred years that was written after the events. Uh, how good is eyewitness testimony two or three hundred years after an event? Yeah. <laughs> this is 15 to 18 years. Uh, how many of you remember 2008? Raise your hand. That's 15 to 18 years. That's 15 years ago. 
How many of you remember when uh, Barack Obama was inaugurated as president? Shoot, raise your hand. You remember that? Anybody got a testimony about that? Don't say it here. <laughs> no, this is not the time. Hey, anybody remember when the U.S. Airways uh, jet went off the runway in, in New York and went into the Hudson River? Y'all remember that? I remember that. God was like a hero pilot who managed to bring that one in. How many of you remember um, the, the Olympics when they were held in Beijing, 2008? I, I remember they, they held it in a new stadium that they built for that, and it was called, anybody remember? The Bird's Nest. Was that my wife? Yeah. yeah. She remembers that. All right, honey. She remembers that because we were in Beijing adopting that girl sitting beside of my wife. Um, and they were building the bird nest, and we went by it and saw it. Um, so if we need to know details and facts, did it really happen? I mean, did Obama really get inaugurated president? Yeah. How do you know that? Because you were witnesses. Did that, British, did that U.S. Airways flight really? Yeah. We could find all kinds of actual data about that, and we could share it with one another, and we know it because it actually happened 15 years ago. Beijing Olympics. I can pull up video over after video after video of all the events that happened in the bird's nest in Beijing in 2008 because it was just 15 years ago. That is how long after the resurrection of Jesus Christ this was written. The, these people, there were eyewitnesses to it, living, breathing, walking, just like we are today, that remember those things. This is early, early on. In fact, this is the earliest letter that Paul writes. It's the first one. The only book in the New Testament that is earlier than this is James' epistle. And here's the great thing. Liberal scholars... And let me, let me redefine that to you. Lost people who think they know a lot love to say that Christianity developed over a long period of time and what the people believed in the day of Jesus was so far removed from what people began to believe two, three hundred years after that. It developed into this big mythological junk. They have nothing to say when they go, oh, this was written 15 years after it. Whoops. We can read Galatians and we can read James. And guess what we find? We find the exact same faith, the exact same gospel that we preach in this church and teach in our classrooms every single Sunday. Praise the Lord. We don't have a fabricated faith. We have facts. Location, where, where is Galatia? Galatia is not a city. Galatia is a region. It's a group of cities. Um, it's the only letter in the New Testament written to a region and not a, a single location. Southern Galatia includes cities of, see if you recognize any of these, Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Some of you remember that because Acts 13 and 14, this is, this is Paul's first missionary journey. This is Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. You can go through those two chapters and you'll read about his whole journey through Galatia. Um, little, little overview. Antioch. John Mark abandoned Paul right before he went to Antioch. Kind of puts it in our mind maybe a little bit. They um, go to Antioch without him, and they have great success, but a group of Jews stirred up, and I'm not making this up, stirred up the mean women of the city, and the mean women of Antioch ran Paul out. If you're a single man and you're looking for a good woman, don't go to Antioch. <laughs> Okay, apparently they got a lot of mean women in Antioch. Then they, they leave there, so they, they stir up these mean women, they run them off. They go from there to Iconium, and again, the gospel has great success there, but a group of Jews poisoned the minds of the Gentiles who were believing the gospel, and Paul and them had to flee from Iconium. They leave there and they go to Lystra. Uh, Paul sees a man there, and this is always 
perplexing to me. He is lame, this man is, and Paul sees that he has faith to be healed. I would like to be able to see that. <laughs> what does that look like? I, the only thing I know is that, man, God showed him that this man could be saved, could be healed. And so Paul heals this man, and boy, did they have a ruckus over that. They actually thought that Barnabas was Zeus, and that, that Paul was Hermes, and they began to worship them, which is not an unusual thing. If you didn't know the gospel and you saw a lame man healed and you would just revert back to whatever gods you believe in and go, dear Lord, this must be our God. And they tried to worship them. They had to pull them up out of the ground to keep them from worshiping them. But there was a great response there to the gospel until, guess what happened? The, the mean Jews, the women from Antioch and the Jews from Iconium came and stirred up the multitudes so that they stoned Paul and left him for dead, dragged him out of the city and left him for dead. What happened? Paul died and that was the end of the story. No, nope, he's writing Galatians. The, the believers circled Paul and prayed over him. And he stood up and went, shoo, that was wild. <laughs> wow. And it says the next day they went on to Derby. I don't know about you, but if I was stoned to death and got up, I don't know if I'd feel like going to Derby the next day. It's in Kentucky if you've never heard of that. <laughs> in Derby, they made many... By the way, when I just said that we just had the most powerful time in our day, in silence and prayer to God, that's what it took to raise up a stoned Paul from the dirt. They went to Derby and made many disciples, and then they came up with this great idea. Let's go back through all those cities we just left and strengthen the converts. How many of you are volunteering for that mission? Let's go visit the mean women. Some of them were also sweet. But they go back anyway. By the way, a love for the people of God will lead you to do all kinds of crazy things in obedience to the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I share all of that to say, these are the people Paul is writing to. Paul is still thinking about these people in Iconium and Antioch and Lystra and Derbe who are believing the gospel. And he's writing back to them because he's concerned. And it's clear that all of these troublemakers that have run Paul out, run Paul out, stoned Paul and left him for dead, are now putting pressure on these new believers. And it's pressure that goes like this. Jesus alone is not enough to save you. You need to be circumcised, you Gentile pigs. You need to be circumcised you need to become Jewish proselytes and you need to start taking up seriously the ceremonial law of God if you ever hope to be right with God. And so Paul is fearful for them, is hurt for them, and he loves them and he writes this letter to them. Those people that stir up such thinking or believe such thing, we often call them Judaizers. Judaizers who are, are Jews who have heard about Jesus. And listen, they've heard about Jesus and they're impressed. Okay, these are not people who deny Jesus for the very most part. These are people who have heard about Him and they're impressed, but they cannot let go of Judaism as a, as a means of being right with God. They insist that faith in Jesus, as permissible and maybe even as good as that may be, is not enough to save Believe in Jesus, great. But become Jewish proselytes, be circumcised, and keep the ceremonial law of God. That is the only way you can be and stay saved. And we would just say it is Jesus plus. That's the false gospel, okay? What is the false gospel that millions of people believe in this world and maybe some people in this room even still? It is a gospel that says Jesus plus. And by the very definition of that, that is a cult. Uh, you can think about how many of you love math. All three of you, please raise your hand. <laughs> I love math. <laughs> I love math. 
Uh, you can keep up with a cult. You can get an idea of cults and what they are by, by thinking in terms of math. A cult can be by addition. There's your math term. It won't get much harder than that, I promise. There's no cult by calculus, okay? It's just cult by addition. Jesus plus. It's adding uh, some other source of revelation. Uh, what's a cult, a known cult that adds another source of revelation other than the Bible? Mormons. Uh, Latter-day Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. I still call them Mormons. They don't like that. Um, but they have added a uh, new word of God that we must follow their cult. A cult can be uh, not only by addition, but it can be by subtraction. Uh, and we think about that in terms of subtracting something from the deity of Christ. Making Christ less than what he actually is. Um, is there a known cult that does that? Yes. Jehovah's Witnesses do that. We do not believe Jesus is divine. He is not God. He is really, really super duper special, but he's not God. Okay, that is cult by subtraction. Uh, the other way you can do that is either by bringing Christ less than he is or making man more than he is. And again, we're back to the LDS church. Because the LDS church says, hey, as we are, God once was, and as God is, one day we will be. We're gods. <laughs> Don't mean to show, I'm a god, you're a god, we're all gods. No, we're, we're all cults. That's what we are. You can be a cult by addition, adding another source of revelation. You can be a cult by subtraction, somehow detracting from the sufficiency of Christ alone. You can be a cult by, what's the next math term? Multiplication. You can multiply the requirements for salvation. What's the requirement for salvation? Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And then you can say, and this, and multiply it by three, and multiply it by four, and multiply. That's a cult. And that is exactly what the Judaizers are doing here. And then a cult can be by, what's the last one we haven't talked about in math term? Division. You do, do, a cult is known because they divide the loyalty of God's people between God and some other institution. In other words, uh, you must believe in Jesus and be a faithful member of the church of uh, you know the LDS church. If you're not in the LDS church, you're not going to heaven. You can trust in Jesus, but you're not going to heaven if you're not in the LDS church. Um, Mormons do that. Jehovah's Witnesses do that. Um, Sometimes some Catholic friends do that. If you say you believe in Jesus, but you're not in the Catholic Church, you're not saved. And by the way, just to be fair, sometimes Baptists can do that. Okay, you ever heard the joke? Boy, have I heard the joke. You go to heaven and they're giving somebody a tour through heaven and they say, here, here in this one big room, well, there's Catholic believers in the Lord Jesus there, there are Methodist believers, there are Western believers. And then they walk by a door and it's closed and somebody says, what's in there? And says, shh, that's the Baptist. They think they're the only ones here. <laughs> Bad joke. Bad joke. These, these Judaizers managed to chase Paul out. And now they've managed to put pressure on these new believers to the point that they're beginning to buy into a false gospel, a gospel that says Jesus plus, or requirements multiplied. Now, in addressing this letter, there are a few things, key things that Paul wants to assert. And we'll, we'll look at those three, three things that I want to point out. Number one, he is putting a lot of emphasis on apostleship. I told you about that parenthetical thought in verse 1. He's opening the letter saying, Paul, an apostle, and all the brethren who are with me. That's who's writing it. And to uh, the churches of Galatia. But he's got this parenthetical thought. Paul, an apostle. Hey, wait a minute. I'm not an apostle from men. I'm not an apostle through man. But I'm an apostle through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He wants to talk about this apostleship thing. As a matter of fact, the, almost the whole first chapter is going to be about apostolic authority. In, in fact, look down at verse 11 and we understand why he's inserting that, that little thought there in verse 1. He's going to elaborate on it. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ Himself. And He's going to elaborate on that. 
But what is he, what's the deal with apostleship? What does he mean by that? And why is it so important to us? The word apostolos in the Greek just means a sent one. A sent one. Not sent, not smelly one, but a sent one. One who is sent to do something. If you, if you said, Jason, your sermon is going to 1.30, we're hungry, please stop talking and go get us pizza then I would be an apostolos. I would be a sent one. Where was I sent? Pizza. To get pizza. By who? By you. People who are tired of a long sermon. So it can be generally any person for any task. But when it comes to church authority, it points to this unique fact that this man, Paul, along with 12 other men, you could list them, have been authenticated by the Lord Jesus Christ and sent out by Jesus. So they are apostolos, but who sent them? Jesus. And for what purpose? Not pizza, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. The truth, the doctrine, the true doctrine of the church. These 12 have been sent out personally by Jesus and they are the bearers of God's truth. Uh, the, the Word calls them the foundation layers. I said this the other week. When do you lay the foundation? If you're going to build a building, do you lay the building and then lay the foundation? Or first thing you do is lay the foundation. Once you've laid the foundation, do you continue building the building and continue building the foundation? No. You lay the foundation then you build the building on the church. That is what the apostles were. They are the foundation layers of the church. Uh, we, we have 12 of them that we know, the 12 apostles. You can find them in Luke chapter 6, uh, uh, verse 12 and 13. There's a list there. tells us there that Jesus spent all night doing what you and I spent a couple minutes doing a, a while back this morning. He prayed all night long. And then he called all of his disciples to him. And out of all of them, he chose 12 of them. You say, that's not fair. That is not fair. Take it up with Jesus. He had 12 apostles. He called who he chose to call. And that's who they were. By the way, who was, who was one of the disciples and the apostles that we don't? Yeah. Ooh. There was a purpose for that. That one, by the way, was replaced. Judas was replaced. Here's a Jeopardy question. You might, oh, I gotta, who, who replaced Judas? Yeah. Matthias. And there were requirements of that. He said, of all these people who have been with us, from the baptism to the, to the ascension of the Lord, they had to have been there. They had to have been eyewitnesses to that. From the baptism to the ascension, out of those, choose somebody to replace Judas. So that we got the 12. And then, so that's the 12. Then we've got one apostle who was chosen out of due time, and his name was Paul. You can read about that in Acts chapter uh, 9. Where was Paul called as an apostle, a sent one of Jesus? Where did that happen? The road to Damascus. He met the Lord Jesus. And you remember, he, he's traveling to go persecute the church, and Jesus says, how about take a little rest here? And, uh, and let me tell you who I am and what you have been chosen to go do. Was he looking to serve Jesus? No, he was looking to condemn Jesus. And Jesus said, Whoop, 180, uh, you're going back the other way. Thank you very much for your service. And, and, and then he, he sends for a man named Ananias. We've talked about Ananias recently. And, and he says, hey, Ananias, there's a guy named Saul. And I said, yeah, I know him. He needs to be hooked up with them, one of them women in Iconium. <laughs> because, I mean, Antioch, because he, ooh, I don't think he's a very nice man, Lord. And, and, and Jesus says this to him, go. That's pretty, that's pretty sharp, wasn't it? Yeah, go. For he, and listen to this, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to, and here's the words, to bear my name before Gentiles, before kings, and before the children of Israel. He is an apostle. Jesus showed up to him personally, personally called him to serve him in this way, and, and said so even to Ananias. Why 
Does Paul harp on his apostleship here? We, we read other letters of Paul. Paul is not a bragger. Paul is not a look at who I am. Why is he hammering apostleship here? Because Paul knows that these other Jews have been pushing their gospel, which is a gospel of Jesus plus, right? A cult, a false gospel. And Paul wants these Christians to know that what Paul says, he says on authority as one who was commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, and commissioned for the truth by the Lord Jesus Christ. I need you to know that I am an apostolos of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you've got to hear the true message and not the screwy message. Now, what does apostleship mean for us? What is this truth uh, about who the apostles were, what it took to be an apostle. What does that mean to us? It means several things. Number one, it means that the apostles are unique. The apostles are unique. Do you know this? You don't know this. Do you know that a lot of people have a lot of religious opinions? You don't. <laughs> you ever met anybody that had a lot of religious opinions? Only the apostles were commissioned and authenticated by Jesus to be His authoritative messengers only. In other words, the apostles didn't carry their opinion about Jesus or their opinion about salvation. The apostles' words were God's words on the matter. And the New Testament in its entirety was written by the apostles or in the case of Mark and Luke, by trusted associates of the apostles to whom they entrusted their words. Mark was a companion of both Luke and Peter, and they informed him for his gospel. Uh, Luke was an, a, a, a follower of who? Of Paul. And that's where he got his information. But that, that means this, that the notion... There's a couple of things that we, we tend to get very wrong here about what the New Testament is and what authority is. How many of you have ever met anybody who said, I, I'm a red-letter Christian? You ever heard of that? I've met red-letter Christians. And what that means is that they only follow the words written in red in the Bible. Why are words written in red in the Bible? Because that's what Jesus says. And what they're saying is, listen, man, I don't follow anybody else. I am just going to live by the words written in red. That is an absolutely error. Why? Because what the, the apostles were authenticated, commissioned by Jesus. That means this, that the, that the word written by Paul or Mark or James is as much the word of God as the words written in red in your Bible. I, I've met other people who say, you know, I don't, I don't, the Bible is just so complicated and there's so many contradictions in it. That's just what people say. But there's so I just live by the Sermon on the Mount. You ever met any Sermon on the Mount Christians? I've met several. I just I live by the Sermon on the Mount. That is absolute error. The Word of God came to us through the apostles, through the Lord Jesus and the apostles that He sent out. Um, no interpretation of Scripture is of any private uh, origin, but, but holy men of God moved us. The Spirit of God moved them. All of God's Word, whether Paul wrote it or James wrote it or Peter wrote it, is the Word of God. Some people say, I, I, I follow the Sermon on the Mount, but I reject what Paul says about men and women and sexual immorality. Any way that we can limit what God says in our mind, people will gravitate toward that. It's false. The Word of God is the Word of God. It includes the writings of the apostles. That's one thing we need to understand from understanding who the apostles were. The other thing is this. Since they had to have seen Jesus and be appointed by Him personally, that means there are no more apostles. There are no more apostles. There are circles within the church with people who like to call themselves da, 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 da. Apostle Jason. Oh my goodness. They're not. What was that? I like the sound of that. I don't like the sound of that at all. <laughs> it, it, it scratches my flesh, but man, does it stir up the spirit in me. Uh, 
They're not apostles. If you hear of a church that has apostles, just say, ding, something's off there. I remember I, I, I met a guy named, I, I won't embarrass it, but I met a guy whose name rhymes with Zim. I thought his name was Zim today. It reminded me of going to Zimbabwe. Um, we were driving from uh, Harare to a place called Rua. Um, and we were going to be doing some church planting work there. There was a young pastor who was ready. He was trained. He was ready, but there was no church. And we were going to go help um, local pastors and local Christians reach out and do church planting work in Rua. And on the way to Rua, we passed by fields. And one, this is just a fun little thing. If you want to know what Rua in Zimbabwe looks like, then just go drive past these big, big, big open fields in Kansas. I told my wife when we first got here, this reminds me of Zimbabwe. <laughs> Except I kept meeting all of you, and you don't look like Zimbabweans. But you'd go by, by these fields, and, and every once in a while you'd see a guy standing up with this white hood and sheet going all the way down to the ground, dragging behind him. And you would see three, four, five, maybe 10, 12 people sitting down at his feet. And I'm thinking, this is weird. And you just periodically see it. And I asked one of the Zimbabwean brothers, I said, brother, who, who is this guy in the sheet out in the field? He said, oh, they're apostles. Apostles? Oh, that's nice. He said, I said, tell me more about these apostles. He said, they're absolutely crazy. He said, "What they their, their whole idea of ministry is this. The Bible is like a newspaper from 1928. It, it may be some news, but it's old news. But if you want new news, you need to come out to one of the apostles. I said, wow, that's dangerous. He said, man, they're, they're, called, they're, they're awful. And they're, so they go out there and they do that. People will bring them things and make offerings to the apostles out in the field. By the way, go stand out in the field in Kansas, see if anybody brings you money. That'd be, that'd be a pretty fun experiment. And I said, man, how does one get to be one of the apostles? And he thought for a minute, he looked at his buddy and laughed. He said, you go buy a sheet. <laughs> If you meet an apostle in the 21st century, they went and bought a sheep. And, and you need to treat them like that. I don't mean treat them mean. You need to treat them like somebody who needs to hear the gospel. And they need to understand other things about the word of God. But you know, more often than that, we have an apostle problem in the United States. And again, maybe in this room. Because... People decide that they can ask God and whatever they feel like they hear from God is equal to the Word of God. I, I met with a couple one time. They were living in absolute immorality. Uh, again, I've said this before, but if, you, if I shared the details of this with you in this room, uh, in these rooms, and said, are they living well or living in immorality? I believe you'd get a 100 A+. Plus. It wasn't kind of, sort of, a little off. It was like, wow, man, this is bad. And, I, and I, they invited me to their house. They'd come to my church and they'd been there for God. They invited me to their house. And they said, listen, we know what the church thinks about what we're doing. And they said, but look, we prayed. And God told us it's okay. You know what they did? They bought a sheet. Okay. They decided for themselves that whatever they felt, whatever they thought they heard from God was as authoritative as Scripture. They bought a sheet. I can proclaim the answer that I received and no one can question it simply because it's my answer. Man, our world, it's a southern phrase, our worlds eat up with that. <laughs> the apostles have spoken. They were appointed by Jesus. They were authenticated by Jesus. How did Jesus authenticate these men? These 12 plus 1. Man, the Spirit of God, the power of their Word. But listen, miraculous things. Does the Bible talk about miraculous things happening? As a matter of fact, does the Bible talk about these apostles doing the exact same amazingly miraculous things that Jesus Himself did? Yes. 
The Baptists get crazy about that stuff, but that's, that's what the Bible says. Listen, he was authenticating them. Not as good men, not as Christians, but as apostles. Jesus authenticated them and called them and sent them out personally. Did you know Jesus did not come to me to call me to be a pastor? I did not see the risen Lord. I didn't. I look forward to the day, but I didn't. I didn't have scales on my eyes. Kind of glad about that one. <laughs> no, the Spirit of God impressed on, on me very strongly that He was calling me to serve Him in this capacity. But I am not an apostle. These men are unique. And when someone claims that and they wrote God's Word... And when someone claims that they have received an answer from the Lord in prayer or on a mountain somewhere or out in the field somewhere, and that answer does not align with Scripture, we are right to question that and to challenge it with the Word of God. Amen. So no more apostles. They are unique and there aren't any new ones. And it also means this, there are no new books of the Bible being written. Okay, remember what the first uh, cult issue was? Was a, by, a cult can be by addition, adding revelation from someone else somewhere else? Listen, if there are no more apostles, then there are no more books that, are, have, that were written after their time or that are waiting to be written now. None of the books written in the second or the third century are Scripture. We, we have to understand that. They don't deserve to be put in the Bible because they're not the Bible. Does that mean that nobody wrote anything good and edifying in the second or the third century? No, not at all. Just nobody wrote Scripture. And we've got to be careful that we don't treat as Scripture what other people wrote. And by the way, that goes for John MacArthur. It goes for John Piper. It goes for Jason Murray. I don't like to write. It goes anybody else. It's not Scripture. That's why I said at the head of this message today, the only perfect thing you're going to hear was what we read out of Galatians. Well, what about the Gospel of Thomas? It's not the Gospel of Thomas. It's not the Word of God. The early church didn't accept it as the Word of God. Did they accept it as interesting? Maybe some of them. Did they accept it as edifying? I don't know. Shepherd of Hermas was certainly seen as edifying to a lot of the church, but they knew it wasn't Scripture. It's kind of like Pilgrim's Progress. Is that edifying? Sure. Is it Scripture? Heck, no, it's not Scripture. These people who wrote after the apostles' time have no authority, not scriptural authority. John's last writing, and I say this because he was the last apostle, John's last writing was the last writing of Scripture. It was closed because apostleship is vital to truth. And that's why Jesus chose them. That's why Jesus put parameters about who they could be. And that's why Jesus authenticated them. So, does apostleship matter? Paul's going to talk a lot about apostleship next week. It matters for all of those reasons. Another thing that he says here in this uh, opening, even in the opening verses, uh, opening verses of this letter, is something about the nature of salvation. Even in the greeting... Verse 3, here's the greeting. You ready? Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill, but I don't believe this is a molehill. Um, because he's going to unpack in this letter this notion of grace and peace. A very common greeting from Paul, but one that highlights the reality of the gospel every time he shares it. What is grace? It is unmerited favor. What does unmerited mean? Unearned, undeserved. It is God giving to sinners what they by no means can earn. Um, I'm, Aaron, Aaron Cunningham is here. Aaron, what does quid pro quo? I have to say that slower. I'll say it wrong. What does that mean? This for that. This for that. Tit for tat. I'll do something for you, and then you can do something for me. Please understand this. Grace is not quid pro quo. I scratch your back, and if I do good enough, you'll scratch mine. 
Grace is unmerited. I have nothing that I can do worthy. Nothing that I can do that would cause you to show favor to me. But that's my only hope. That is grace. And Paul says, grace to you from God. Um, we talked about Mary a couple weeks ago. Mary uh, is someone we think of as full of grace. And, and by that token, we, man, so often we very much esteem, maybe even venerate Mary. Um, was Mary full of grace? Please listen. She was not. She was filled with grace. And what was grace? Oh, because she was so good, God gave grace. No. It was unmerited favor. In her case, you can call it unmerited favor. That was really bad and it was off the cuff. Forgive me. Act like I didn't say that. It was... It was not that she was so great that God showed her favor. That's quid pro quo. God shared favor with her. Grace. By grace. Noah's the same way. We think, oh, Noah was a great man in his generation. He was perfect. And God does say that in Scripture. But before that, it says this. Noah found grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. What did Noah do to earn from God what God was going to do? Not a single thing. By the same token, why is this important to Galatians? Because what can they do to merit somehow God forgiving them? Nothing. And yet they are buying the lie from Judaizers to say, but you must do something. And you must do this something and that something and that something in addition to trusting in Jesus or you are not saved. Paul says, listen to me, I'm telling you, grace from God. And the next thing is peace. Peace is not an easy feeling. I don't care what the eagles say. Peace, that was another bad one. Sorry about that. He's not offering them peace in that sense, but peace with God. And, and it is the result of grace. Because God has given as unmerited favor to us, now we have peace with Him whom we have sinned against. Remember the, the gospel question at the beginning of this message? How can I as a sinner ever be made right with the God against whom I have sinned? And He tells us that by grace. And with that grace alone, there is peace with God. Some of you walk in this place without peace because you know there is division between you and a holy God. How can you be saved? There is one answer by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. How does, how does this grace come, by the way? Look at verse 4. Uh, the Lord Jesus who gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God and Father. How does grace come and peace come to us? Through the Lord Jesus who substituted Himself to pay the penalty of my sin and your sin. That's what the cross is about. That's what the tomb is about. And resurrection is God saying, I receive that and I will show you the new life that I will give to you when you trust in my Son. And he raised him from the dead and he walked around for 40 days and showed himself to 500 people at one place and other people in addition to that. And he did amazing God things. Last of which was just lifting off and being received to the right hand of the Father. And they watched him as he went. And this letter was written 15 years after that. And Paul is giving him his life, being stoned and left for dead, being run out by mean men and mean women everywhere he goes. And he keeps going back because Jesus. Because he's heard the gospel and he's understood the gospel and he's met the risen Christ. And the gospel is clear. You are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus who died in your place. And then there's that other shout of the Reformation that we haven't talked about. And it's verse 5. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Listen, if it is God's grace through His substituting Son, then salvation is to His glory. Salvation brags on no one but God. There's no, looky what a good boy you have been. 
There is only by unmerited favor. God has sent His Son and shown you that. Lit up your heart with the truth of that. And even as He raised His Son from the dead, when you trust in Christ, He raises you from the dead. There is no, look what a good boy Jason is. Listen, any crown that I receive, any crown that Mary received, any crown that Noah received is going to be what in the kingdom of God? The Bible says it will be tossed back at the feet of Jesus Christ. Why? Because salvation is to glory of God alone. Now, is it to our benefit? Oh my goodness. Is it to our joy? Yes. Is it to our, our righteousness? Oh my goodness, yes. But it is not to our glory. And the message that the Galatian uh, Judaizers were pushing to them is, no, you must share in this. It must at least be in some part because of you being circumcised. It must be in some part because you were a good boy and a good girl. And Paul says, no, that's a lie. And by that gospel, you would be lost. The last thing that he shares in this uh, introduction, and we'll wrap up very quickly with this, is his, his uh, apostolicity, to use the bigger word. He shares the nature of salvation, and then he shares the third thing in verse 6, and that is his shock. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him, from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. You know, every other letter in the New Testament has a warm, cordial greeting right about here in, in that letter. Go, go look at Philippians. Go, go look at any of the other letters and you'll find, you know, from Paul to you, man, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. Oh, we pray for you regularly. Not in this one. He just skips right down to it and says, I am amazed at how quickly you are turning from Christ. In other words, cut the formality of a Greek letter. I can't get over what you've done. I saw that meme on Facebook the other day and said, if, if, if Paul saw the church in America, we'd be getting a letter. Yeah. Like, you got that right. And I don't think there'd be much of a greeting in that one either. Listen, this is a serious letter. And it's not because Paul's a mean man or mean-spirited. He is not. Read his letters. It is because salvation is the most serious matter there is. And we must get it right. And again, I will say this. There may be some people in this place sitting under this roof today that are not getting the gospel right. There is only one gospel that saves, and it is not Jesus plus, or Jesus minus, or Jesus multiplied by, or Jesus divided. It is Jesus crucified, buried, and raised. It is Jesus sufficient alone. Amen. Now, Paul is going to go on in this letter to say that Jesus creates new creatures out of us. He's going to go on to say that ongoing, unrepentant, and rebellious sin have no place in the Christian life. He's going to go on to say that liberty from the law is by no means a license for us to live an immoral life before God. But he's, he teaches that all of those things are fruit of our salvation, not the means of it. And we've got to get that distinction. And it's one of the reasons we need to study the book of Galatians. And so I will close with this. Are you saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ alone to the glory of God alone? Or are you somehow today striving to yet earn what you don't have through Christ alone? The second song we sang today said something that unnerves me a little bit. That He welcomes you just as you are. And it doesn't unnerve me because that's a wrong statement. It unnerves me because of where we go with that. But listen, it's a true statement. God accepts me just as I am. There's more to be said there. When I repent and turn to faith in Christ. Is my life all fixed up and pretty? No. Does He accept me on the basis of Christ alone? Yes.
But in that moment, he gives me a spirit. He, he makes me a new creature. He gives me a new heart. He gives me a new power. He gives me all things that I need for life and for godliness, Peter says. He does all of those things. But we've got to get it in our head. It's not trust Jesus and do all of those things and be saved. It is trust Jesus and be saved. And now that you're alive from the dead, begin to live this new life. Please get the cart behind the horse instead of in front of him or alongside of him. That's not the gospel. If you've not read Galatians, I want to encourage you to read it in one sitting for chapter one through chapter six. And you'll, you'll say, this is layered. This is a little tough at times, but you'll be ready. And, and we can learn through this. Now, any questions, any thoughts, anything you would share uh, about what we're learning, apostles or uh, the gospel in particular. Any questions or thoughts in the room or in the foyer?